We are in part 17 of our Empowered Church series. We're walking through the book of Acts line by line. Now you go, man, part 17, I'm brand new. I came for people getting baptized, right? Which was a great idea, by the way. But I'm going to catch you up to speed. Today's message is entitled, The Power of a Transformed Life. And I just want to share a couple thoughts before I give you that fill in the blank. And that is this. This weekend, we didn't have everybody be able to show for a variety of scheduling reasons, but we had 49 people register to be baptized. That means that throughout this weekend, let's say 45 folks came and got into the water in front of everybody. Now, that, that's a little bit unsettling. Not everybody is comfortable being center of attention. So a lot of them were able to say, you know what, I'm a little bit nervous about this, but hey, it's for Jesus. So all of a sudden, we had person after person, seri- uh, service after service, that people would stand in the water telling the rest of the world around them, Jesus is my most important. And I think that how many times do we get a chance to really publicly own our faith? And after maybe we did baptism, where are those other times that we get a chance to tell people, God is still working in my life? Because I feel like sometimes after we do an initial testimony, we don't even talk about it anymore. For too many of us, we're pretty quiet about it. But here's the reality. People need to know that God is real. People need to know that he's still moving in our lives. Man, you're a work in progress, yeah? I mean, you're not done, I'm not done. I'm still, until I'm you know, dead, I'm not done, right? So I'm still in process, but we need to keep updating people saying God is still moving in my life. God is still moving in my life. Why? Because everyone around us on this planet is desperately wondering, is this all there is? Is everything that I've experienced, is this it? You're telling me this is life? Man, if they don't have Jesus, they haven't even had the opportunity to see themselves unwrap. They haven't even been able to see all that God built into them come alive, and they're desperately wondering, is there any hope? If we don't tell the story, how in the world are they supposed to know? You're like, oh, well, that's what you're for. I mean, you're the pastor guy, right? So you and all those people on TV and writing books and all that stuff, you guys tell them. No, no, no. They don't know us. They don't trust us. They trust you. They'll believe you when they won't believe me. I mean, they think, oh, that dude's paid for that. Maybe that's something. Maybe that was a real illustration. Maybe that wasn't a real illustration. But when you tell someone, I used to be like this, but I'm watching God transform me into this, they can suddenly believe it for themselves. I'm just telling you, you are the best sermon they'll ever hear. Because if you tell them, they already know your heart. They already know you're legit. And they just need to hear it from you. God's changing me because we know we all need to be transformed we all know that and people want to believe that god is active and alive today here's the fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you it's this god is glorified by our transformation god is glorified by our transformation not everybody can see it we got to be a little bit more verbal about it one of our greatest jobs is to make jesus famous One of our greatest jobs is to tell everybody that he is who he says he is and that he has really made a difference in our lives. All right, I told you we're in part 17, so let me give you a real quick recap in case you just joined us. The book of Acts, and it's actually called the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's a very simple premise. It's this, a guy named Jesus shows up, says he's God, says he died for our sins, got back up. Now, either he did or he didn't. We are Christians, we believe that he did. All right, somehow, some way, Christianity went from obscurity, from nothing, to world dominant in 300 years. The Roman Empire proclaimed the world religion would be Christianity in 300 years. How in the world did that happen? Well, the book of Acts says, well, I can tell you how it started. So it's that little grassroots movement, like how in the world did this whole thing get rolling? And there's victories and defeats and there's good guys and bad guys and there's miracles and there's crazy supernatural stuff. It was a wild ride. The church is so immature and trying to figure themselves out. They don't have all the answers. 
So we're learning right along with them, right? So sure enough, there was a very big main character that shows up along the way, and he's kind of a psycho. His name is Saul of Tarsus. Now, Tarsus is in modern-day Turkey, in the southern area of modern-day Turkey. So this guy, according to his own testimony, is like, dude, I am the most Jewish guy you will ever meet. Like, he was like, I am hardcore. And what he said was, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Like, I am uber Jewish. And he was like, man, I am traditional. I know the Bible backwards and forwards. I'm a Pharisee. I know everything you want to know about religion, about theology. I know everything about God. And here's the deal. This new Christianity thing that just suddenly erupted, yeah, I'm not buying it. It's trash. Because here's the thing, I'm checking my Old Testament scriptures, and I'm not seeing Jesus checking off the list of Messiah. So you know what? I'm not there. I don't think he's legit. And if he's not legit and he claims to be God, I call that blasphemy. We killed him for that very reason, so therefore, I'm coming after his church. And this guy came in hot. He was a Christian killer. He was a Christian persecutor. He would get different letters of authority to go to other, literal other parts of the Roman Empire to arrest Christians and bring them back for trial in Jerusalem. He was a rough, rough dude. What we learned last week, that guy got saved. Are you kidding me? Like nobody had that guy on he's going to get saved list. Like, everyone was like, nope, everybody but that guy. That guy's a goner, man. There's no way that guy's getting rescued. Well, sure enough, he did. And if you have not heard last week's message where Pastor Brian brilliantly lays out who this guy was and some of the dynamics that were going on in his life, it's absolutely fascinating. You could always go back and listen to that. But the story is this. The guy's heading to arrest more Christians, and bam, God gets him. He is on the road to Damascus, a bright light hits, blinds him, gets his attention, voice comes out of nowhere, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's like, I don't even know who you are, and he's like, that's your problem. I'm Jesus, and now you got a problem, right? And so he's like, whoa, and his whole life flips in one moment. And now he's blinded, now he, God has to send another Christian, a guy named Ananias, to go pray for him to get his sight back and to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. So God comes in, he's like, hey, Ananias. He's like, yeah, what's up? He's like, I got a job for you. And he's like, what's that? Like, I want you to go pray for the Saul guy. He's like, yeah, heck no. There is no way, that is a weird dude. That is a mean guy. I am not going there, pick somebody else. And then God says, hold on, hold on, he's my guy. I'm in this, and I want us to begin our story today there. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 9, verse 15? Acts chapter 9, verse 15. In the Bibles under the seat in front of you, it is page 917, 917. If you've got a Bible and you're not used to it, drop it open in the middle, go to the right really far. You're eventually going to see names that you would name your children. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're real close, then it's going to hit Acts, you're going to be there, all right? Acts chapter 9, verse 15. It's an interesting prophecy. God's talking to Ananias about Saul, and he says this, go to him, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before non-Jews or Gentiles, before kings, which is an interesting prophecy and before the children of Israel, or Jews. And, but here's the key, verse 16. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Why did he tell that to Ananias? I mean, it was so significant, he wrote it down. In like the most popular book of all time. Everyone was going to read this thing, right? Why did God tell him that? He could have just let it happen. He didn't need to say it. Why? Now, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say why, but here's my guess. I think God understands that what is true sometimes is not so easy to emotionally handle. Let me give you an example. 
It is estimated that at this time in Christianity's story, the greatest number of the Christian church people is probably only around 7,500 people. Bridgeway has approximately 4,000 people. You can't even double our size. You already have all the Christians that were existing on the planet. Why? It's a brand new movement. So you got to assume if it's that small of a community, even though people are scattered all over the place, people talk. So everybody knows everybody, right? And you got to know this. Everybody knows the name Saul of Tarsus. That's the guy you don't want coming to your town. If that guy's around, I mean, he's like a bounty hunter, right? So everybody avoids this guy. He is nasty. He's mean. Everybody remembers the story about Stephen, like the nicest guy in the world. Saul is holding people's clothes so they can stone him to death, and they throw rocks at him till he dies. I mean, this is brutal stuff. Everybody knows this guy. And then what? He gets saved. Oh, no. Right? I mean, there's some people you don't even, I mean, if you were to be honest, you don't even want them saved. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like, uh, hey, hey, it's uh, 1943. You know who just got saved? Hitler. And everyone's like, praise the Lord. No. They're kind of like, Lord, you should have just jumped over that one, right? Just kind of move on, right? So same thing is people aren't super cool about this. And as a matter of fact, I, you may be never in this experience so I want you to emotionally imagine the man that killed your grandfather is in the pew next to you. And I just want you to think how freely you're going to feel to worship. You understand what I'm talking about? Like that guy is in the Christian church. That guy who ripped families apart, that guy who tore children from their parents, that guy who the whole reason why your mom now walks with a bad back is he threw her into a jail cell and she got all messed up. That guy is now in your church. What are you going to do? So as much as we believe that God can change a life, sometimes it's hard to emotionally get there. You know what I'm talking about? And I wonder whether or not God put in this line public for that very reason. Because what was he ultimately saying? Hey, kiddos, I get it. Bad dude. Hurt you a lot, yeah? I got it. I don't need you to be, oh, I'm going to go make him pay. Hold on. I got it. This guy, by the time I get done with this guy, he will suffer so much for my name, you'll be praying for him. You're like, I'll never do. Okay, hold on. Do you guys remember at a later date, he writes a letter and recounts how many bad things happened to him? Do you guys remember this? He's like, I was beaten. I was stoned to death and God had to raise me back up. Still went to work, right? He was there and he's like, I got shipwrecked. Not once, multiple times. Like for everyone else, shipwreck is like a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? And he's like, it was a Tuesday. Like this is so terrible. Like I've had, I was totally had nothing. I remember believing I was going to die. I remember all these things. My life has been brutal. I've never had the good Christian life thing. When you hear that story and he has caused you pain, there's a certain degree where you feel like, okay, he can be on my team. Because this is a lot about unity, right? I mean, God didn't have to do that. It is so fun that God sometimes like balances out things, right? You're like, oh, you get to hurt a bunch of people and then you're all good. No, it seems like God balances it out. You know, I think about it, when God creates a, a man as attractive as David Beckham, <laughs> he balances it by giving him a terrible voice and he's very short. And, and, I think, and I think to myself, thank you, Lord. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's things like that that restore my faith, right? That's not true. Okay, moving on. Let's pick it up in verse 19. For some days, this new saved psycho was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the Son of God. And all who heard Saul were amazed and said, wait, 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 is not this the man 
who made havoc in Jerusalem of those Christians who call upon the name of Jesus? Has he not come here to our city in Damascus for this very purpose to bring Christians bound back to the chief priests of Jerusalem? What did you just read? Everyone's freaking out. All the Christians are freaking out. All the group that was anti-Christian, they're freaking out. Their number one patriot just got saved. Nobody knows what to do. This is totally wild. And it says immediately, Saul takes advantage of his invitations to speak at synagogues and walks in, not with an anti-Christian rally, but with a Christian message. You think that doesn't blow people's minds? You know that is not what they wanted. That is not what they signed up for. Dude, when they put up his posters and everything, come, Saul's gonna tear Christians apart. You know, that kind of thing, right? And he walks in, he's like, I'm a Christian now. You're like, no, what? Right, now he has this opportunity because they don't, they don't yet know him as Paul the apostle. He's still Saul the persecutor in their mind. So they're still inviting him into their synagogue. He takes advantage of that and preaches for Jesus. That's risky. I wanna make this a little bit personal to you. I don't know what you got saved out of. When I mean saved out of, I mean you used to be one way and then somehow Jesus got your attention, right? So maybe some of you had the story like me. You're like, oh, my, my testimony's lame, right? Oh, I was six. What was I saved out of? A life of crime, <laughs> right? You know, ate too many cookies, you know, that kind of thing. I repented of my ways, <laughs> right? You go, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. That story's beautiful because God has been transforming me all my life, and that might be your story. It is the very same thing you've been praying over your children since they were in your womb. I'm telling you, that's a glorious testimony. But some of y'all came from some pretty rough environments. I'm talking about environments of maybe addiction. Maybe everyone you knew was into meth. It was your whole world, man. That's all your friends. That was all the connections you had. Your family was into it. You knew nothing else other than drugs. And then all of a sudden, God whispered your name. There's some of us that maybe came out of an occultic background, right? Satanic stuff, all kinds of weird Wiccan stuff, right? And then we come out of that. And some of us came from the gang background, right? The whole, whether it was biker gangs or whether or not it was street, whatever it was, some of us came from some pretty rough environments. I would consider a rough environment that if you came from a hardcore, intellectual, science-based, Christians and intelligent design is nonsense. If you came from that environment that just hated Christians because it's all garbage, if you got saved out of that environment, that's a tough environment. I don't know what you got saved out of, but here's where it gets personal. You have a very tiny window for them to want to listen to why you left. Why? Because at first they're like, dude, I can't even believe this. What the heck? So where you been? You're like, well, I know this is weird. I know, give me a second. I got Jesus. They're like, what? No way. You became one of those? No, come on, man. That's like what? Like a new phase, right? They'll give you a very short amount of time to talk about it because the minute they realize you're locked, they don't want you saying a word. Don't talk about it around me. I don't want to hear it. You're done. There's a very tiny window of opportunity. Now, I don't know how you use that window. I don't know whether or not you made it all personal and quiet and all that stuff, and they never got to hear why you left. Some of you might have done it, I don't know, maybe out of self-preservation. There's some of us that barely got out. I mean, there was so much temptation in that world. There was so much addiction in that world. We could not look back. That's okay. But if you do, if you're in that place right now, if you can hear my voice and you know that you're in the process of being transformed right now and you are emerging, I'm telling you, this is one of the most beautiful opportunity windows you will ever have in your life because they just want to know why you left. I want you to tell them, hey man, it was Jesus. That's why I left. 
I mean, yeah, now that I have Jesus, there's a bunch of reasons why I needed to leave, but I didn't, I didn't know. So I'm just letting you know. I still love you. Sorry, but I got to go, right? There's this beautiful opportunity. So sure enough, he takes this opportunity. Saul comes in, starts preaching about Jesus, right? And you're like, that is such a radical shift, man. How do you go from anti-Christian to Christian overnight? Like, is that even a possible thing or is it just not real? I mean, do people really flip-flop one way or another that fast? Actually, they do. Let me tell you a story about the other direction. So, many of you know my story. As I was growing up, music was everything to me. Um, I, it was just kind of became my identity. At 13 years old, I began playing drums. I was teaching adults at 15, 16 years old. We were doing shows. I was preaching the gospel from the stage, and I was really into heavy metal. Now, when I'm talking about heavy metal, I'm talking about melt your face off music. I'm talking about, I'm talking about hardcore. If it doesn't hype you up at the gym, it's boring. You understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about intense music, Metallica and Slayer and Slipknot, all these things, you know, like hardcore music. Music. And so I had hair down to here. We're going in bars and clubs. We're preaching about Jesus and all that stuff, right? And it was like my whole world of my life. Well, when you're in the Christian metal scene in the late 80s, it's not like it was a huge world. I mean, you kind of knew everybody, right? You were kind of like, oh, I know that band. Or you know things about them. You'd read up on each other, stuff like that. So there was a band in Southern California that was uh, as evangelistic as we were. Very, very out loud. All their lyrics were so hardcore. Now, once again, uh, th they would talk about Jesus, but the music sounded like everybody else's music, right? And so there was a band named Vengeance Rising, and the lead singer was in ministry. His name was Roger Martinez. So we knew about him. We'd go to their gigs, and they'd know about us, stuff like that. Well, sure enough, and, and by the way, do not Google Vengeance Rising. If you play this for your grandmother, she will die instantly. Okay, I'm just letting you know, this is really intense stuff. Okay, so anyway, so as I got out of the music industry, as we get into the 90s, as I get out of the music industry, I'm like checking back on how people are doing and stuff like that. And they're like, dude, did you hear about Roger? I was like, well, what's up with Roger? They're like, dude, he's a Satanist. And I was like, what? Sure enough, I checked out. His whole website's flipped over. He's no longer promoting Jesus Christ. He is promoting Satan. He is saying all Christian stuff is garbage, everything. You know. Now, what you can see, if you read between the lines, you saw a lot of hurt, and he flipped hard. But when he flipped, he flipped really intense. And so he is just spewing garbage and terrible things, and it was leading all these different people away. And I was just, my mind was blown. I was like, man, that guy was like hardcore for Jesus, and now he's the other direction, right? Well, periodically, like every 10 years, I kind of Google and check up on different people and stuff like that. He went on to be an ardent atheist, and he's still that way today. And I just go, man, is that real? How can you go from someone who is actively promoting in the ministry so extreme, how can you flip in a day? You're like, well, oh, man, this is so depressing. I can't believe I came to church today. What a waste. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm about to give you the most encouraging thing you've heard all week. You ready? I believe that the vast majority of people that you're going to interact with in your life today, tomorrow, and next week are one split second of flipping to Jesus. And I want to tell you why. Most people are not Christians because the dots don't connect for them. They cannot see a way that it's true. They may agree on the Jesus part, but then there's a church part that freaks them out. They love the Jesus part, they just can't stand the people. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's these little blocks right? Like you're, you, you, you know that this part is true. You know in your heart, you're longing. You know that you were built for more. You know there's a God in heaven. You know this isn't accidental. You know that evolution isn't right, but you don't know how to fit the pieces together. And so you've just said, no, nope, it's not for me. But what if God shows up? What are you going to do? Probably the most ardent public atheist, probably in my lifetime, um, at least popularly, is a guy named Richard Dawkins. 
Richard Dawkins is a um, brilliant man, does not seem like a mean guy, super sweet guy, but he has ardently debated Christians about in, uh, intelligent design. He's kind of an evolutionary theory guy. He's kind of an atheist champion. He's kind of all over the place, done all kinds of interviews and things like that. And so when you kind of look out and you're like, man, who are people that you would probably not assume will ever get saved? Richard Dawkins is one of those guys. But you got to understand, that was Saul of Tarsus. You see, in his world, the reason he was so anti-Christian is if Jesus isn't God, it's blasphemy. But what if he is? And one day he showed up and his whole world flipped just like that. I would suggest to you that those that are most adamantly against Christianity are all that much closer to the kingdom of God. Why? What are you so upset about? Why are you so agitated? I'll tell you who I worry about are the people that don't care. You understand what I'm talking about? What I'm telling you is what if Jesus reveals himself to your personal friend? What are they going to do? I'll tell you this, their life will change in an instant. I really believe that to the core of my being. So it brings up a couple questions. You're like, okay, so Lord, I'm reading this stuff and you took this super anti guy and made him legitimate because you like got him on the road. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so I've been praying, let's say for my friend Marianne, right? Lord, you need to do one of those things on her, right? Like she's on her way to Ulta Cosmetics. And then all of a sudden, like this bright light hits her right in the car. She's like, ah! And then her car crashes into a pole, but you saved her anyway. And then you take her out. She's like, I'm blind, I'm blind. And then suddenly she's like, oh, I want to be a Christian, right? Like it worked for him. You should just do it for Marianne. It's very effective, Lord. How come you don't do that more, right? Because you're like, man, if we want to get people saved, why doesn't God just kind of, you know, open the sky, boo, yeah. You know, and, and everybody gets saved, right? It, it seems rather easy. Why doesn't God do that more? Okay, there's an answer for it. I don't know if you know the answer. Here's the answer. Currently, God is leading a revolution of heart and a revolution of love. There will come a day when he will open the sky and reveal himself. Do you know what the Bible says happens on that day? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because they will not be able to do otherwise. When God rips the sky open, everybody falls. That's how it works. He's like, no, no, no. I know how to do that. That's not difficult. What I'm telling you is, until that day, I'm interested in you and me having a relationship. And I don't want to start our relationship based on fear. I want to start our relationship based on love, on kindness. I want you to love me. So I'm going to be more gentle. I'm going to keep whispering your name. I'm going to keep following you around. I'm going to keep being all stalkerish. But I will find some way to win your heart over because I love you that much. So why don't I do more radical, rip the sky open? Because I want your heart. That's why. Okay? All right. One more key point I think that he brought up we got to talk about. And that was, it says, and then Saul goes into Jewish synagogues and argues Jesus is the Son of God. Now that's radical. Jesus didn't even refer to himself as Son of God very often. That was a title that ended up everybody else would use about him. But sure enough, he called himself Son of Man, and he called himself the Messiah, and a bunch of other things. But sure enough, Saul comes in. If you want to tick off somebody that does not believe in the Messiah, start saying Jesus is the Son of God. If you say he's the Son of God, that's akin to saying he's God. That's called blasphemy. You're going to tick everybody off, and it's not going to go well. But that's his message. So it begs the question, at least for me, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Okay, so how can he be both? How can he be God and the Son of God? You guys ever think about this stuff? 
Like in between Netflix, this is what I think about. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Okay, so you, I know you've thought about this a little bit to somehow, some way, because people keep using different terms. Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God. You're like, well, which one is it? Pick one, right? No, 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 it's actually both. But here's what, what's fascinating to me about the, this, this whole concept is that I truly believe you've asked yourself this question, and almost always it was when you were trying to figure out how you were gonna start your prayers. <laughs> right? Anybody know how to start a prayer right? Right, because we have a bunch of camps. There's the Heavenly Father camp, right? Every prayer they do, Heavenly Father. You're like, oh, okay, you're a Heavenly Father person. There's Dear Jesus people, right? You got that one, right? Now, if you're charismatic, there's Good Morning, Holy Spirit. <laughs> right, uh, whatever it is. You got all your little things about how you start your prayers, right? And in the back of your mind, you know you've all asked the question, did I start with the right guy? Like, did, did I mess that one up? Like, is there, should I have done something different there? Right? And everybody knows how to close. In Jesus' name, amen. But very few people know how to start. Okay, the reason why I bring this up is it has to do with the nature of God. Now, if we're supposed to love God, we're supposed to understand Him. And one of the things about Him is that He is a triune being. So we talk about three in one. We talk about there is one God. At no point can you ever say you believe in a faith that teaches three gods. That's not correct. There is one God, and that is, that is something that we have to die on that hill. You understand what I'm talking about? There's one God. But we talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, cool. So now we got three persons, and that's what we say. There's three persons of God, but there's one entity of God. Oh, how in the world does that happen? Well, the only thing I want to focus on right now is this whole Jesus part. How can he be the Son of God and yet God at the same time? So I'm going to lay this out real quick, as simple as I can, and it's going to bless three of you. Here we go. I hope it's you. Okay. Here we go. Follow my, my line of thinking. Here we go. Let's begin. First thing we need to note, God, by definition, is eternal, self-existent, dependent on nothing, and that deity is deity. What's my point? There's no baby deity. There's no half deity. You're either deity or you're not deity. Does that make any sense? There's not, you know, because a lot of people are kind of like, well, like when, when, when adults have the Holy Spirit, they get the Holy Spirit, but when kids, they get a little junior version, like a little baby, like gingerbread mankind. You're like, no, they're all, it's, you either get the Holy Spirit or you don't get the Holy Spirit, right? And they're like, yeah, well, maybe there could be God and God light, right? Less filling, less calories, stuff like that, right? Okay, but that's not true. By definition, if it's God, God is everything. So you go, no, it, you can't have half God or it's not God at all. It's like being half pregnant. You understand what I'm saying? Like, that's not a thing. You either are or you're not. Okay, cool. Now, second step. Follow me. Whenever God interacts with mankind, there has to be containment. Why? Because non-God can't handle all of God. You guys tracking with me? Literally, you can't handle the truth. Yes? Like if you saw all of God, the Bible says no one has ever seen God and lived. In other words, it'll blow your head off. You cannot handle all of God. That's why whenever you see these pictures in the Old Testament of people having visions of the throne room of God, you're like, what did he look like on the throne? They're like, it was this beautiful shimmering green. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. What's he look like? It was like shimmering. <laughs> you're like, well, that was not helpful. You just said the same thing twice, right? No, 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 what's he look like? You'll realize any time you interact with God and there is something that you're seeing, it is a containment of the greater. You just can't have all of it, so you gotta have a containment. Anytime you're talking about containment, you're gonna put a label on it. Well, when Moses was walking in the desert, he had a burning bush incident. Was God in the bush? Yes, he was. Is God only a bush dweller? No? Okay, cool. When God creates, we call him creator. When God is being nurturing, we call him father. When God is 
invisible and guiding and empowering, we refer to him as the person of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're going to see portions of God move out and interact with you, but it has to be contained. And because it's not all of him, you can't say it's Yahweh. Yahweh is all of him. So what are you going to call him? Well, we have a bunch of labels, a bunch of terms. And three of those portions that emerge out of God that can operate distinctively, we call the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus, if he is God at all, he is God, but we're going to put a label, Son of God, on him when he does a certain role. What's that role? Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was not the Son of God until the virgin conception. Why? Because he took on a new role, became the Son of God, took on humanity, and moved forward into that role. We were not seeing all of God. We were seeing a portion of God. You guys remember that one of the ways that many people have described the Trinity is they said if you could, if this was cut off right here and you saw three fingers coming up over the top, you would say, wow, this one moves without this one. They're all independent, but are they not yet on the same hand? The persons that emanate out are unique. They interact in different ways, but are they not still God? Of course they are. Jesus is both God and by role and function, Son of God. Amen? All right, cool. Two people understood that. Praise God. <laughs> Pick it up in verse 22. Meanwhile, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. When many days had passed, we find out it was about three years, the Jews plotted to kill him. That happens a lot to him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But the disciples, his disciples, took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a laundry basket. Awesome. Well, that's kind of covert. That's kind of cool, right? Hey, he was going to get killed. You're going to find out lots of people like to kill Saul, right? He, for whatever reason, he ticks everybody off right? He's just kind of very blunt and very straightforward about things, and people don't like his truth. Okay, quick question for you. Is it okay to escape persecution? I mean, he did, right? Now, is that wimpy? Is that not trusting in God? Because some personalities are like, yeah, I'm going to stand up in front of the machine guns. I want to be… Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you're not called to that, what's wrong with you? Now, some people are called to that. There are stories of martyrs in the past where the Holy Spirit revealed to them, I need you to die today. And they walked right into it. But if that is not your calling, there is nothing wrong biblically with saying, oh no, there's a plot to kill me. I'm going to get out of the way. That's not cowardice. That's just trying to be wise. You're trying to be a good steward with what God gave you. Now, once again, whether it works or not is up to God. You may have tried to get out of the way, but you may or may not get out of the way. That is his determination. But there is nothing wrong with saying, wow, this persecution is heavy. I think I need to move on. If God says, I need you to remain, then you remain. Does that make sense? Let's keep moving forward. And when, after all this time, Saul had come to Jerusalem, that's the ground zero. That's where all this stuff started. This is where the Jews have the most hardcore culture, where Christianity was most persecuted at the time. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the other disciples, but they were all afraid of him. They didn't believe he was a disciple. Pause. What happened? He got rejected. Because what happened was his reputation is messed up. I don't know if this guy's legit. I don't care how long you said he's saved. This guy could be a mole. I mean, that's kind of how he infiltrated before. So no, I don't trust him. This guy has killed people. This guy's not messing around. So no, I would love to be, hey, let's trust everybody. Let's be open. But you know what? It's not worth it. So he knocks on the door. Hey, can I come in church? Nope. Wham! Slam the door. They were like, not today, buddy. Right? 
Now, you're going to find out who he was trying to interact with was Peter, who's the foremost apostle, meaning the leader of the team, and Jesus' brother, James, who was called a pillar of the church. He, he tells that at a later story. So he's trying to interact with them. They're like, nope, not going to happen. But then, notice this, verse 27, but Barnabas, that's key, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus, so they let him in. And he went in and out among them in Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Well, that was a big turnaround. What happened? A guy named Barnabas. I want to camp on this for a second because I believe there are some Barnabases in this Church, and I'm going to tell you right now, you're gold, and I want to tell you why. First of all, Barnabas is not his name. His name is Joseph. Why is he called Barnabas? Well, because it's a nickname. Bar, in their language, means son of, right? Son of what? You find out it's son of encouragement. Well, what does that nickname mean? It literally means, man, I love having this dude around because he blesses my spirit and encourages me. That's a cool nickname. That means everybody wanted to be around this guy. Why did they let Saul in once Barnabas got a hold of him? Because if Barnabas says he's legit, he's legit. Everybody knew Barnabas' reputation. Saul's reputation got him banned. Barnabas' reputation got him included. Reputation matters. How you live your life, if you are a joker that's flaky, on, off, on, off, we don't trust a word that you're going to say. We don't trust who you back up. But if you are legit and you say somebody is right, we're going to follow you. So they let him in. This Barnabas guy is one of those connectors, right? He knows everybody. You know people like that. It might be you. For whatever reason, people just come out of the woodwork and they just want to hang out with you. They always want to come to your house or whatever. Hey, what are you doing today, right? And you just think you're being you. You have no idea. You're gifted, anointed, and talented for it. This is a movement of God. You're like, well, I'm just a partier. (laughs) Okay, hold on. That's called a abuse of God's gift in your life, all right? But make no mistake, that is what can become of this. The idea that God would use you to connect people, I don't think you understand that is a calling. I don't think you understand that's an assignment. I want you to start thinking through the lens that Christianity is like a kingdom business and you need to connect the right people with the right people and start getting a little bit more strategic. I think you need to start realizing you are the hub of community. Our church needs more community and sometimes we need people like you to run a small group because they're the only ones that are going to go to your small group. Why? You're not weird. You understand what I'm talking about? Like, we need people that are connectors, that are so fun to be around. We had a gentleman in this church, his name's Patrick Rowe. He ran our men's ministry for a while. Still does it, right? This guy's legit. And all these dudes want to go and hang out with Patrick Rowe. Just go to his small group. Why? Because he's cool. He's the nicest guy in the world. He's super funny. He's a connector. So people just gravitate towards him. I'm telling you, we got a bunch of those in this church, and I don't think you realize what a big deal you are. Because here's another thing that Barnabas did. He was an encourager. The difference between trying to do ministry discouraged and encouraged is a world apart. The encouragers of this church are the reason why people don't quit. I mean, you want to talk about longevity in ministry. Man, I've been here for over 25 years. I got people on my staff that have been here for over a decade and a half. I got people that stay. The only reason they are still around is because Barnabases in this church continue to encourage them, continue to pour back into them, and continue to tell them that it matters. You guys are the reason why we keep going. You're like, oh, I was just trying to be nice. I know, but not everybody has that gift. I'm telling you, some people have the gift of being a joy sucker. (laughs) Know what I'm talking about? Might be from the pit. Anyway, that's not important. But if you have a gift of encouragement, if you have a gift that you just think about, man, I want to text that person and just say, hey, what's up? I really appreciate you. If you want to pour life into other people, you guys, that's like gold. Please don't think that's not a big deal. It's a huge deal. 
Oh, I'm just being me. I know, and we desperately need you. Just be that encourager, and we can keep going. We need you. Let's pick it up in verse 29. And Saul spoke and disputed against the, Jew, the Greek-speaking Jews, but they too were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to the seaport of Caesarea and sent him off back home to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. You guys, why was there suddenly so much peace? You're like, oh, okay, well, one of two things happened, right? Either the main persecutor guy, the psychopath, got saved. That calmed everybody down. Or two, when he got saved, it kind of sent the anti-Christian movement into a tailspin because they're like, oh, our big dog's gone, right? What do we do? Who's supposed to rise up now, right? Either way, God flipped the script saved the main ringleader, and suddenly there was peace. You're like, okay, you're saying like I'm supposed to do something about that. Okay, here we go. You ready to make it personal? <clears throat> what if that leader that you despise, you stopped complaining about and prayed for? Because I'll tell you this, somebody prayed for Saul, and their name is not in the Bible. But there's someone, and I bet you anything, it was a lady, a lady, probably later in her years, walked with God, and the minute she started praying for Saul, Jesus went, I'm on it, let's go. Wham! Heals that guy overnight. Turns a Christian killer into one of the greatest Christian theologians, one of the greatest church planters, one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Here's the deal. You can either complain or you can pray. You're probably not going to do both. And I wonder whether or not that one leader you keep thinking is a big deal and seems to be causing all the problems in society, how about they get saved? Because i got to ask you a question. Do you want them to die or do you want them to get saved? You're like, meh. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, are you a child of destruction or are you a child of salvation? There we go. Amen. That means we pray. That's why the Bible says, pray for your leaders that it might go well with you. In other words, man, why don't we have a revival in them and it's going to change everything? Because as long as they are still viewing the world through their own lens, they're going to continue to do what they do. But what if Jesus shows up? That's going to happen through the prayers of the saints. That's where the Lord's going, dude, I'm just waiting for my people to pray. Man, I can go at any time. You ready? I'll flip the script on anybody. Are we praying? Because I tell you, I think society could go a little different if God's people would pray. You guys, we're going to close out with just thinking about these last words that he wrote. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church thrived, the church grew, the church multiplied. Why was there comfort? Well, less persecution. Praise God. What does walking in the fear of the Lord mean? It means this. When you respect God enough and put him in the right position, all of a sudden everything else changes perspective. And you start seeing the world through his lenses. You guys, the Bible says when Saul got rocked by Jesus and blinded him, when he got prayed for by Ananias, things like scales fell from his eyes. What were those things? I don't know. That's gross. <laughs> right? But those were blocking his ability to see. I'm going to tell you right now, here's what I'm going to pray for us as we close. You guys, some of us are looking through some wrong lenses. And I'm going to pray that they fall out of our eyes. Some of us are still looking at the world through victimization. You're not a victim. You're a victor. Some of us are looking through the lens of despair. Despair does not belong in a Christian's vocabulary. There is always hope. In this life or the next, there is always hope. There are some of us like me looking through the lens of anxiety and allowing that to dominate their thoughts. That is not the Prince of Peace. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are some of us that are looking through the lens of betrayal. All we can see is where we've been hurt and we're still operating off that. 
We've got to release these things and let them fall out of our eyes and begin to see what God has. We do not need to look out into the world and see everything falling apart. We need to see Jesus on the throne making things right. What I'm telling you is that we need to pray for some of those lenses to drop and get some new eyeballs, amen? Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for today, Lord, the way that you have opened our eyes in so many ways as we walk through your word. I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, in this beautiful holy moment, that you would allow those false lenses to drop from our eyes. That God, that there's some of us that are still thinking about our past and we're looking through the lens of our past. Lord, in Jesus' name, may those fall and we look only through the future of Jesus Christ. We now say and we renounce that whether or not there has been evil that has distorted our lenses, we pray in the name of Jesus, renewed lenses. We pray renewed perception. We pray renewed perspective. Lord, there's some of us, and we're constantly thinking about that which is wrong, that we look through a worry lens. I come against that in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, that we might be able to see you as provider, as protector, as hope giver. I just pray, Lord, that you would begin to change our eyesight all the way across. Anyone being able to hear my voice that right now would be able to lay their eyeballs down on the altar of God to be able to say, Lord, let me see that in the New Testament, Jesus, you were healing so many blind people as a symbol of saying, I need to let you see through my lenses. God, we just pray for the spiritually blind in Jesus' name to be able to see right here, right now. We pray, Lord, for all of us that are seeing in too limited of a way that we do not see with spiritual eyes, that we do not see with supernatural lenses. God, would you open up our eyes that we might be able to see the glory of what you're doing around us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, amen.